You know, this, mo- this morning when I left home, as I was walking to the car, I could hear chants. But not that a person was chanting, but someone had like a radio or TV on and they, it was some Greek Orthodox service. And so they'd be listening to these priests chanting. And sometimes when I leave the house, I hear, uh, I, not I hear, I smell incense, someone burning incense. What's going on there? What are they doing? Well, what you have is a person who is basically playing church. He's not actually going, meeting with other people. He's not actually going to participate and be part of a group, be accountable and minister to others. He is basically saying, I'm going to stay by myself and I'm going to play church. And I was thinking, what's the big difference between that and the evangelical who is not part of a church, does, does not care to meet with other believers and encourage other believers and be encouraged and minister and be ministered to, but rather sits at home and maybe listens to some hymns that he has on his CD or uh, listens to a sermon on the internet. He's playing church. Now they have different backgrounds, so the, pers- so the one person has the chants and the incense, the other person has hymns and uh, sermons, but they're both playing church basically, but not actually being part of a church. And I know a lot of people who will say, you know what, I, yeah, I don't go to church, but um, I hang out with other Christian friends that I have. You know, we talk about God, or you know, maybe I have a book study with a couple of people. And, and there's nothing wrong with those things. Those things are fine, but they're not church. Um, one of the most misused passages in all of Scripture. I'm sure I have misused it, and I've, I know. I've, I've just heard pretty much everyone who ever uses this verse misinterprets it. Um, is, well, where two or three are gathered together in my name, that's where I am. And they say, yeah, I don't need to be part of a church. I have a couple of friends over who are Christians, and hey, if we're Christians, Jesus is there. Now look, if you're a Christian, you can be by yourself and Jesus is with you. That's, that's not the issue. Every time someone throws a verse at me, I say to them, where is that verse? And they usually say, well, I don't know. Okay, it's Matthew 18. I say to them, okay, uh, what's the context? I don't know. Okay, well, let me tell you the context. The context of that verse is church discipline and excommunication. The passage is where Jesus is saying, if a brother sins against you, uh, you know, go to him, you've got to deal with this. If he doesn't listen, go get two or three witnesses. If he doesn't listen to them, take it to the church. And if he doesn't listen to the church, then you deal with them, basically excommunicate him. Deal with him like he's an unbeliever. For where two or three are gathered in my name, that's where I am, Christ said. The point is that the church, based upon the two or three witnesses, the two or three people in his name, The church has the authority, in Christ's name, to excommunicate someone. That passage has nothing to do with the the definition of the church. Nothing to do with the definition of the church. Whatsoever. Okay? And so, in our passage today, at the end of Acts chapter 2, what we see, what is a church? What are the characteristics of a church? Now, it's only seven verses that we're going to look at, so it's not that it's going to be everything that we need to know about a church, but it's a good place to start. If you want to know what a good Christian church looks like, it's a good place to start. So... Acts chapter 2, and we'll start reading in verse 41 to the end of the chapter. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, 
and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Remember our context, we're on the day of Pentecost, Peter has preached, he has told them that Jesus is the Messiah, he told them that you crucified the Messiah, they said to him, brother what shall we do? He said, repent and get baptized in Jesus' name, and that's what they did. Today, what we have is basically the birth of the New Testament church. We're going to see what the life of the first Christian church was like. So, first thing it says, I know we looked at this verse a bit last week, but we'll do it again. Verse 41 says, those who gladly received his word, this is Peter's word when he preached, those who gladly received his word were baptized. So, you have these people who, who have joined this group of believers, have joined the church. Um, they receive P Peter's word, first of all, and keep in mind when we say, yeah, it was Peter that said it, but it's actually God's word because Peter was God's messenger. And there are a lot of people who hear the word of God, but they don't receive the word of God. There's a big difference because there are so, most people have their own preconceived ideas, their own traditions, their own likes and dislikes, and they hear the word of God, and they say, well, if that fits with what I like, I'll believe it. If I don't like it, I skip it or ignore it or whatever. You're not allowed to do that. These people received the word, regardless of whether they liked it or not, because this was a hard word. They, he just told them that they killed the Messiah, but they accepted it because it was the truth, and they believed it. And they didn't only receive his word, but it says they, they acted upon it. They did something about it. It's not just, oh yeah, I believe and go my own way. They believed and they were baptized. We talked about this last week. Yes, baptism does not save you. They knew that, but instead of saying, um, well, since baptism doesn't save me, I don't need to do it. No, it's the commandment of the Lord. So they went ahead and they did it. They received his word and they got baptized. And then it says, that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. 3,000 people added to this group that we had. There are a lot of people say, I love Jesus, but I could care less about the church. I'm sure you've heard that. And I say to people, oh, so you're telling me that you love Jesus, but you don't care about his body? How does that work? You love Jesus, but you don't care about his bride? How does that work? Well, I can worship at home by myself. Yeah, okay, that's true. You can worship at home by yourself. But here's the thing. Every time someone says, well, I can worship God by myself at home. I can read my Bible at home. I wonder, okay, if you're at home, and you're saying, I'm going to worship God by myself. And you're going through Hebrews. And you hit Hebrews chapter 9, where it says, do not uh, forsake the assembly. The as assembling yourself with other believers. How can you be obedient to, obedient to that verse if you're staying at home? You can skip it. You can ignore it. But that's not worse than God. Ignoring His Word. You have here these people who believe, they get baptized, they join the church. Yes, I know that God saves individuals. But after He saves individuals, He puts them within a church. I have very, very little respect for people who call themselves Christians and are not members of a church. I'm telling you right now. Here it says 3,000 people were added. Initially we had about 120 people, so now we have 3,000 more. So we have approximately 3,120 people. This is a very specific, identifiable group. It's not a random, oh, some people are in, some people come out. They know who the Christians are and they know who are... Who, they know who are Christians and who are not. They know who is within the church and who is not part of the church. You know, there's so many places, there's so many times when... Here, we, you know, we have people who show up sometimes and then they leave and we don't see them again for months. 
show up, stay for a few months, and then leave. There's no accountability. There's no being part of the group. It's just whatever. That is not how it was here. They understood that we are part of something. We are part of a group. In 1 Corinthians 14, Peter is, uh, excuse me, Paul is dealing with, uh, you know, in Corinth there's all these people speaking in tongues all the time and he's trying to calm them down a bit and saying, okay, let's not go overboard. And he says, because if an outsider comes, if an unbeliever comes and he's sitting among us and everyone's speaking in tongues, he's going to think you're nuts. But he says, if, you're, if he hears the word of God, though, he'll understand that God is in this place. But the point that I'm trying to, what I want to point out, is that he says, you can have an outsider who's sitting within the group. Attendance doesn't make you a member of the church. Simply being there doesn't mean that you're part of the group. An outsider can come and sit there and listen. That doesn't make you part of the group. These people understand that we're part of a group. It's, we're committed to this group. We minister to this group and ministered to by this group. So we have 3,000 people who are committed to God and to one another. And we will see how this works out in the next few verses. Verse 42 says this. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Stop right there. There are four things that this church does. There are four things that these people do that are mentioned in this verse. They, f they continue in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Number one, they follow the apostles' teaching. They follow apostolic teaching. Okay? In Matthew 28, Jesus had said to his disciples, uh, this is right before he ascended to heaven, he said, go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all those things that I have commanded you. Okay? And that's exactly what we've seen in Acts chapter 2. Peter preached the gospel. People have been saved. They're disciples. They get baptized. And now they continue in teaching. The apostles' teaching. Okay? The apostles were devoted to teaching. And the people were devoted to learning the apostles' teaching. Now we don't have apostles today. But we do have apostolic teaching. Okay? And we need to be devoted to learning the Bible. There are so many people, there are some people, Christians, who are not really big on studying the Bible. And they don't, and they think that we who do study the Bible, uh, we're, we're being a bit too, too much. And they say, you know, it's not about theology, it's about God. I've heard that. It's not about theology, it's about God. Let me tell you why this, that statement is a bit off. Because the moment you say, because that statement alone is a theological statement. Do you follow me? If you say, well, it's not about theology, it's about God, that's a theological statement. Whenever you make a statement about God, that's theology. It's the study of God. So every time you say anything about God, that's a theological statement. And look, none of us know the Bible well enough. None of us. In, in uh, Matthew 24, on the, uh, excuse me, in Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus was talking to the two disciples, and he calls them fools because they don't know the Bible well enough. Okay? So, you, you don't know the Bible well enough. None of us know the Bible well enough. In Hosea chapter 4, God says these words. He said, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. They don't know God. And that's why they're destroyed. If you look at the world around you, look at Greece right now. What's the problem? I know a lot of people will tell me, Oh, the problem is the economy. The problem is the bad politicians. 
The problem is greed. The problem is whatever. These are all byproducts of a much bigger problem. The bigger problem is that there is no knowledge of God. There, people are godless. And when you have godless people, this is what you get. That's the problem. We need to have a better understanding, a better knowledge of God. And so these people, the early church, gave themselves to studying God, studying the Bible. They were given to apostolic teaching. That's number one. They kept learning. Number two, what do they do? First is apostolic, they, they continue in the apostles' doctrine, or apostles' teaching, same word, and fellowship. Okay? Fellowship, the Greek word is kinonia. They shared things in common. They were connected. They had deep relationships with one another. I know so many people, Christians, the only time they're with other Christians is for one hour on a Sunday morning. And all the rest of their friends during the week are unbelievers. And I'm not saying they shouldn't have friends who are unbelievers. That's fine. But there needs to be a balance. When you spend one hour with Christians and all the other hours with unbelievers, things are going to... This is the reason why so many people come into the church with so many unbiblical, unchristian ideas because they spend all their time with unbelievers. I'm not saying we shouldn't spend time with unbelievers, but there needs to be a balance. These people were connected, had great relationships with other people in the church. With other people who were believers. They shared their lives with one another. Which again, leads me to say, I reject the concept of, well, I'm a Christian, but I stay on my own and I don't, I'm not a part of the church. So number one, they continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and in the breaking of bread. So we've got the apostles' teaching, fellowship, and breaking of bread. Now the question here, some people say, what is the breaking of bread? Some theologians will say it's the Lord's Supper. Other people say, well, it's just meals, a normal meal. I don't know which one it is. It could be both. You know, we, uh, for us, we have meals at home and then we have the Lord's Supper here. But that's not exactly how they did it. First of all, they met in houses back then. They didn't have church buildings like this. And as far as we can tell, many times the, uh, having the Lord's Supper was connected to actually having a meal. So, either way, both are true. I mean, we know that they had meals together. You read it in a few verses from now. And we know that they had the Lord's Supper. So, again, again... I want you to get the feel of this. The point is that they had deep relationships with one another. It was close. They ate together. They prayed together. They did things together. And number four, they continued in prayers. Apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. They were devoted to praising God and seeking His direction for what they needed to do. You know, I think too often our prayers are... How can I put this? Just... Repetition. You know, when we have prayers here before, in the service, we're not just doing that to fill the time. There's a purpose that we're praying. If we're just trying to fill in the time, then we might as well not do it. Okay? We... So often it's like, okay, I need to say a prayer about this. I say the words and well, I did it and there you go. We need to be more earnest in our praying. We need to be a praying people and pray and mean it. Remember a couple of years ago when Manuel got really sick? Oh, Dina remembers that. And we thought he was going to die. Did you think you were going to die? I remember we were at the hospital. And the doctors came to Dina and they said, uh, he needs to go and have surgery right now. If he doesn't have surgery right now, he's going to die. And even if he has surgery right now, he's so uh, unstable that he could still die. And you know what we did? We prayed. I prayed 
and Dina prayed, and a bunch of people from the Filipino Fellowship came, and, and we prayed, and I called people from the church, and they prayed, and, and I called Bob Feather in the U.S., and he told the church there, and they prayed, and he called Paul Reno, and they prayed, and we had people all over the world praying for Manuel. And it wasn't, Lord, please make Manuel better. Amen. I said my prayer. It wasn't like that. We meant it. We meant it. We, it was like we were sitting on the phone waiting for God to answer and we were saying, Lord, we need an answer. Yes or no? Are you going to make him better or not? We were waiting upon God. And he said, yes. My point is, my point is, don't wait for things to get... We all, we're always fervent when things are bad. Something is really bad and we need help right now. But we're not like that the rest of the time. We have such short memories. We pray and pray and pray for something and then God answers our prayers and then the next day we've forgotten all about it and we're we'll worrying again and oh, woe is me. We, these people were praying people and we need to be like that. We need to be a praying people. Be connected to God. One last point, one last part, excuse me. One last point in, in verse 42. Because they continued in the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship and Breaking of Bread and in Prayers. But the point that I, one last point that I want to make in verse 42, it says they continued steadfastly in these things. It's not that, uh, oh, they did it once and then stopped. They were devoted to this. This was their lifestyle. This was every day. This is what their life was about. Doing these things. How often have we had people who show up in church. Oh, they like the people. Because it's very, you know, you go to church. You meet nice Christian people. It's nice to hang out with them. Or you listen to a couple of good sermons. Oh, that's really nice. And then they hang out for a month or two or six months. And then they just kind of get bored of it and leave. These people are committed to this. They're committed to God. They're committed to the church and they continue in these things. So verse 43. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. The wonders and signs were not done by all the believers. They were done by the apostles. And you remember when Jesus did miracles back early, uh, early in this very chapter Peter had said that when Jesus did miracles, that was God attesting to him. That was God saying, this is the one, listen to him. It was proof that he was from God. And now Jesus has gone back to heaven, and the apostles are continuing now, and they're doing miracles, and that's God's way of proving that they are indeed his representatives. And it says, fear came upon every soul. I don't know, some people tend to think that's every soul in the church. Other people think that it's fear upon everyone who was around there in Jerusalem. I tend to lean the second way. It doesn't mean that everyone was saved, but even when Jesus was doing miracles, fear would come upon people and they were amazed at what was going on. It doesn't mean they were saved, but they, they understood that something supernatural was going on. And I think that's what's going on here. Verse 44. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. Now there's two ways I can approach these verses. And I'm going to do both. Number one, this is not talking about communism. <laughs> you know the communists have a favorite passage. Yes, that's true. They, Everyone in the world has a favorite passage of the Bible because they know that the Bible has authority. Even atheists have a favorite verse. You know what it is? Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 1, where it says, Don't judge lest ye be judged. And they say, Hey, there you go. I can rape, cheat, steal, do whatever. You can't judge me. You know, whatever. Uh, so even communists have a favorite verse. And, and this is it. They had everything in common. And they say, you see, there's no private property here. It's just throw everything in a big bowl and share everything. Share the, the money. That is not what's going on here. First of all, uh, the Bible is not against private property. In fact, in the law, there are plenty 
of uh, commandments concerning private property and um, protection of private property. And second of all, which is most important, in this passage, there is no government forcing you to give up what you got. There is no civil government. There is no ecclesiastical government. There is no one forcing these people to give up what they have. What we have here is Christian love. Christian generosity. Christian selflessness. You have people who have more and you have people who are in need. And those people who have more, they care for their brothers and sisters in Christ. And they say, if that person is in need, I will take care of him. I will help him. That's what you have here. You have people giving up the more that they have so they can help out those who have less. Okay? That's number one. Because I said there's two ways of approaching this. That's number one. Number two. I didn't say what I said so that you can say, I'm glad Nico said that. Now I don't have to give away my stuff. Because I want to keep my stuff. Uh, no, keep in mind that the Bible does say that we are to care for our brothers and sisters in Christ, not only spiritually, but physically also. In James chapter 2, it says, if a brother or sister comes in and he doesn't have food or clothing, what are you going to say? Are you going to say to him, go in peace, be fed and be clothed? That doesn't help. Okay? We need to care for one another like a family. And it's not just spiritual, it is physical also. Jesus said... Jesus said, our Lord Jesus, this is how people will know that you're my disciples. If you love one another. Is there love between the church? Between the people in the church? That's what's going on here. These people loved one another. And they took care of one another. So that no one was in need. Verse 46. So, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. So it says they continued daily. This is not just one day a week. Daily they would meet with one another. This was a close-knit group. And again it says, with one accord. They continued daily with one accord. Just this continual unity and love that existed within that group. They continued daily with one accord in the temple, it says. Keep in mind, this, the book of Acts is still a transition period. We've got a bunch of Jews who have become Christians, still living in Israel. There's the, the, the cutoff from Judaism and the temple has not complete yet, but we'll get there fast. Uh, if nothing else, they could be in the temple and witness to other Jews who were there. And we see that there's joy. They continue you know, in, other, in house to house, eating together, gladness, praising God. And it says in verse 47, having favor with all the people. Now that is unusual. That is not common. Uh, because we know the Church of Jesus Christ has been persecuted for 2,000 years and very soon persecution is going to hit. Within the next couple of chapters, persecution will begin and will never stop. Okay? Still goes on 2,000 years later. But, for some reason, right in the beginning of the birth of the Church, they have peace, even with unbelievers. Even with the people around them. They find favor with all the people. And... I don't know why, this is just the thought. I'm not being dogmatic on this, this is just the thought. If you remember, when, the, when, Jesus brought the, when God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, it says that he could have just taken them straight to, to the land of Canaan, but if he took them a certain way, they would immediately find other nations there that would go to war with them. And he didn't want them to get disheartened and discouraged that the moment we've left Egypt, we strayed into war. And so he took them around. He took them down into the desert where there's nothing. Okay? Just to get used to the fact, okay, we've left Egypt, we're on our way, we're going to have our own nation, we are going to fight, but all in due time. And I'm wondering if that's something similar to what God is doing with the church here. He is saying, you know what? Instead of just throwing them 
to the lions the moment the church begins. Let's give them a little time. <laughs> mature a bit. Grow up. Get used to what it is to being the church. Because persecution is coming. The war is going to start hard very soon. But for some reason he, he gives them peace with all the people. And as a result, since they had a good relationship, even with the people outside, the last sentence says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So, you start off with 3,120 people on the day of Pentecost. <laughs> and, and every day, more people are being added to the church. You start off with the 3,000, but every day more people are being added to the church. And of course it says that the Lord is adding people to the church because salvation is of the Lord. He's the one that saves people and places them within the church. But let me close. Let me close. Just say this. We have here the birth of the New Testament church. You have a group which does not just say, well, I believe and then I go my own way. They, they believe and they act upon that faith and they're devoted to God and devoted to the church. We have a church here which learns the word of God. We have a church that worships God, praises Him. And we have a church that is loving and caring both to the people inside and to those on the outside so that those people on the outside can see the love that exists here and be drawn to that. That's my prayer that we should be like that. I hope that our church can become like that, can be like that. A church praises God, loves God, loves the people of God, loves the people outside that we may see more of them get saved and come in. Thank you for your attention. Let's pray.